So I'll just go through the bio, first we've got um, Jesse Keith. Uh, Jesse uh, is the National Tech Not uh, Network Manager, National Network Manager of Design and Manufacturing at Callahan Innovation. Uh, I've trained as an industrial designer here. He worked in New Zealand, Australia, Singapore and China as a design professional in design consultancies, in-house R&D teams and as a private business owner. Jesse's background is in product design and creative strategy with an emphasis on creating and commercializing user-centric design solutions uh, from market opportunity to market delivery. Uh, we have Sandy Heffernan, who's on the end, Dr. Sandy Heffernan. Sandy's primary research interests are textiles design, uh, material culture, and the textiles industry. Innovative textile processes are key in her design practice, and completed collaborations include new yarn developments, textile finishing processes, and sustainable dye innovations. Her postgraduate supervision has a focus on textile industry partnership projects funded by uh, Callahan, Callahan Innovation Grants. We've heard some, uh, something about those this morning, and, and Kelly, who spoke yesterday, was actually one of those um, students who received the grant. Uh, we've also got Jenny Duchet. Uh, Jenny is the program director for Victoria University's new Masters of Innovation and Commercialization. Uh, program, uh, program which, is, uh, which launches on January the 20th, 2016. Uh, Jenny is also just about to complete her PhD uh, on the topic of strategy development of firms within New Zealand incubators. Um, we've had a slight change around. Um, uh, Eva Glass um, from Otago um, Polytechnic, unfortunately, is unwell and had to go home. Um, but at the last minute, Kevin Sweet from Victoria University has um, stepped in uh, to take Eva's place. So thank you very much, Kevin. I don't have a bio for you. Do you want me to read Eva's one for you? <laughs> <laughs> to be too much to live up to. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just going to start. Um, just, just wanted to get, sort of get a sense from all of you over the. Um, over yesterday and today, we've heard a lot about um, this notion of. Um, iteration and, and seeing um, projects through to the end. Um, Margaret and I were talking this morning about a recent uh, Doing Business Index where um, New Zealand rated right at the top of that index in terms of investment at the front end for starting businesses, um, you know, uh, getting, getting capital, getting credit, but actually um, they, they ranked really low in terms of then um, transferring that into kind of exportable, um, exportable businesses. So it seems to support that notion that there's, there's a lot of activity at the front end, but maybe it doesn't get kind of seen through into some of those higher, uh, higher value exportable kind of um, businesses. I just wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to start with you, James. Let's start with me. Um, yeah, I think that's um, an interesting point that I mean, we have, and I mean, uh, obviously a lot of people have shown that. Uh, number eight wire mentality um, and that ability to uh, create uh, solutions at the front end and how well that transitions into, and uh, Simon Brown mentioned it before, into a looking globally earlier on. And um, I think we've been very good at solving uh, problems for ourselves um, and problems that, that we, we have, um, but if we're going to make uh, greater revenue from our investment, uh, our market is so incredibly small when we step away from primary industry that we need to be looking to those other markets and, and, and how we invest uh, in solutions for them so that we, we know that our upfront investment really does maximise its return by being global very quickly. Um, you know, that's, that's a difficult process of uh, investing in all that market knowledge uh, and the user knowledge and stepping outside of our our current uh, sort of frame of reference mm -hmm. to to find other opportunities so just getting outside of that domestic market as quickly as possible i, I think so because uh, we are incredibly good problem solvers uh, you know designers are problem solvers we are translators um it shouldn't really matter uh who the market is i mean it's definitely cultural barriers to get past. I mean, yeah. if you're trying to design for um, or innovate or, or create technology for a market you, you don't understand, um, you do have to go and do a lot of learning. Yeah. Um, but I think the companies that we have that have gone 
gone global uh, you know, really proves that we can do that well. Cool. Jenny, any comments? Um, it's an interesting one. I'm actually the only one here who is not from a design background. Uh, so, I think that's right. Yes. <laughs> so, um, my sort of feeling is that generally there is a I mean, it's such a trendy thing these days to create a, a new business, to kind of create new products. There's so much emphasis on that. But I really feel that, um, particularly what I've found through my, my research on New Zealand incubators, and incubators generally look at businesses once they've sort of got past that initial, sort of really, really early sort of startup phase, and they've actually found an opportunity that they, that they think is, that has really high growth potential. And so I think there needs to be a lot more sort of emphasis on really understanding what that sort of core need is within the opportunity. And, and I know that's been talked about, about already, uh, and I Jane up back made some uh, really good comments about that before as well. But just really understanding um, what those existing behaviours are of the market and what you sort of perceive as that need. And then what the barriers are in, are sort of inherent in that in order to change and to, um, you know, the barriers for your customers to change to basically operate in the way that you want them to. So I think just focusing more on what's been, what's been done already and also particularly on what's been um, done by competitors in that market and not looking at what necessarily what the competitors are doing wrong because people tend to think I've got this, um, this is a fantastic opportunity because you know, these competitors are, you know, they're, they're, they're too expensive or they, or they don't have these features. But there's very little attention from what I've found that's paid to what are these, these competitors doing that are so right? What can we learn from them? What are those critical success factors that they have before we come along and say, here's this great solution that's going to solve these problems? So I think that sort of factor has a lot to do with a lot of the reasons why you don't get that conversion from these early startups through to sort of more successful businesses. I think that um, in, in Simon's presentation, he was kind of highlighting that notion of brand being really important and also channel to, to market. And it seems from the experience that we've been having through this process that um, regional development, you know, outside of Better by Design, for example, uh, regional development agencies um, don't have any sort of design programs uh, or, or any of these incubators don't really have design programs in them that build that kind of design capability or capacity within a company. Um, so, you know, is that something that's kind of lacking in that system at the moment? Better by Design is, it cannot sort of, you know, it, it can't sort of deal to all of that, that community. So is that something that could be useful? I, I, I think put differently. And different seems to be lacking. Kevin, so. I'm glad you came to that because I didn't know how to answer this question until you finally started talking about it. Because you know, I think from the experience, the little experience, I've been here about two years now. The little experience I've had with dealing with companies is that design aspect is what's missing. And while um, that number eight wire mentality of solving problems is there and done very well, um, it's done on a very specific problem. And so there's. Um, not necessarily inability, but there's not this collaboration across problems. And so the companies I've been dealing with are very good at what they do, very good at this very specific thing. But when I could have approached them about something a little bit outside of that, that scope of work, um, they don't have the expertise, the knowledge, the ability to handle that. Um, so I try to bring together some of these pieces that will help them do that. So they have the technology, they have the ability to do exactly what they want to do, but when you try to go outside of the norm, what I would call a designed uh, problem where uh, I want to actually make a problem maybe where one doesn't exist because I want to innovate or do something different, they don't have the designer or the, 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 the innovation to really merge two things together, collaborate, and really expand upon something that they're already doing. Do they know that they need that? They do. They actually they do. That. So the people I've talked to have been, you know, uh, almost begging for help in some way, saying we, we have these tools, we have this capability, um, um, we would love to have someone talk to us and work with us, and that's what I'm doing. I'm, as an educator, I'm, I'm talking to them and working with them and how they can expand that a little bit. But for me, the theme that's been coming out from 
um, the important thing that's been coming out from the last two days is this idea of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea of actually working with people with those diff different ways of thinking and merging that to, to something innovative at that point. Okay, I'll just, um, <coughs> the Callahan project so I've been involved in probably the last three years, so I'm just going to start talking to them. Um, Monique Bowles worked with Lavana and she was using um, technology, using it in a different way. So the first product was this wool blend yarn, which Monique then, so she learned all that engineering process, engineering the yarn, then the software to design the fabric. So with the marketing team, she went off to Melbourne while she's still on a colour hand, and Metallica were the first client. By December that year, they had 10 clients in Melbourne. So there was rapid uptake. Um, Adidas and Nike are now dropping into Levin. So if you can imagine that, it's been significant. Um, and Levana are continuing their R&D, you know, now they've got a white wall, which means you can do a whole new range of colours for different markets. Um, Kelly's project at FibreTech, um, Peter will first roll it out in the luxury lodges in New Zealand. So it was work, she worked alongside a PhD science student, so it was this knobby web that he was working on. And Kelly's challenge was to design um, with minimal disruption to this textile, so the loft had to be retained. Because the problem was, when they export this wool, by the time it gets to LA, it's flat. So, but now, um, so that, and then last week, two more opportunities for Peter came, just happened. Um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Castellini was here from CNC Milano, and he just happened to mention to me, as he was leaving, that he did contracts for hotels. So I woke up the next morning and thought, Peter and Emmanuel have to meet. And so, of course, you know, as long as Peter can prove the fire of the time and see this, he's got a market in Italy for the hotels in Italy. Then, um, you know, picking up on Kelly's Amplify, um, I had the opportunity for us to talk about wool and innovation on Radio New Zealand. And, you know, I thought, okay, that's good. That will appease the sector that are critical with the lack of innovation. But then out of the blue last week, I got a call from New York from one of the top materials companies, and it was like, tell us about wool innovation. The top US apparel company wants to get more wool into its brand, both for apparel and for outdoor wear. So now all these Callahan companies are lined up with not just one client, but several clients in the US. So by sending samples engaged, um, <coughs> Peter's now moved on to the next thing, blend, blending wool with down, and using a protein product. So it's 100% you know, natural, loft retained. Um, so prior to the, the sort of design interventions in those companies, what were, they, what were they putting out? Was it basically kind of raw material or spun wool? Or? Um, well, some of them say were well, classic sheepskins. Um, the problem really was, say, in the 28 stages of processing the sheepskin, there's a lot of waste wool, very expensive to dump it. So Hannah Hutchison's challenge was to innovate. And so Hannah came up with a lot of concepts. You know, her process wasn't a straight line. That was, that was it. Um, that was a material investigation. And, you know, that is a challenge for the students, getting their process to integrate with industry's process. Um, Morris has now gone to another <coughs> company using one of Hannah's concepts and they will produce a new wool um, product combining wool with something that it hasn't been combined with before and it will have multi-functions, outdoor wear and wool everywhere. So and, that's pretty exciting. And the businesses when they're engaging with these students and, and design maybe for the first time, are they sort of realising that kind of value that's being added to what they're um, what they were producing previously? Oh, you can see their light, eyes light up at times, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think, um, like just to emphasise the need for collaboration in these things, just a little story. So, Christy Johnson's um, 2000 project, project, Colours of a High Country, Christy drew a parallel with terroir, you know, and it was the physical science and the geography that determined the colour from that high country station. So it was the latitude, longitude, altitude, all the weather elements, the trace elements, and the minerals. 
determined to come up. If we go south to Dunedin, we'll find a company which is working with that same concept, you know, the trace elements, and they can then analyse those, compare it with wool, and determine the provenance. And you might think, so what? But to companies in public fields, such as Chimera, who produce 6% of the world's textiles, that's really important. Like when I went round their mill, the woman in marketing taking me around had a PhD in forensic science. So they need to be able to prove that the wall in their, their New Zealand wall in this fabric is New Zealand, it's not a Chinese mimic. So it is important. So there's another commercialisation opportunity. And then when it comes to you know, amplifying, that's the story they tell. They give a little bit of wool money back to the dolphins and the And so along that little pathway, there are many opportunities for commercialisation. Yeah. Um, but there's also many opportunities for textiles to work with science, to work with engineering, yeah. to work with... So, I mean, it seems from our the, the sort of research that we did in, in the lead up to um, forming Design Co and the core bid, etc., it seems that to be some fantastic fundamental science out there, some amazing businesses that are producing um, kind of um, products that, that could all benefit from um, you know, the value add that design sort of brings. Is that, the, is that your experience, Jesse, kind of going around? Yeah, I mean, I've only been back in New Zealand just on two years and so I've been in this role for just over a year um, and I hadn't had any connectivity really to the science community. I, I've lived overseas for a long time, um, worked as a professional designer for corporate clients, doing nice work but it, it never had this sort of embedded <coughs> IP that science has the ability to create. So coming back to New Zealand and now being able to go into these CRIs, into these universities and, and see what's uh, being created, but that does sit in a, a different system. Mm -hmm. It's sitting in a system either for education or funded based on a PBRF yeah. model. That's fine as well. Um, as designers, we got, you know, the more access we get to that, you know, the more exciting the product is that we could create. You know, being able to create a product that truly has rich IP in it from, you know, the, the material science or the technology that's in it. And that's really exciting. So I think, you know, and in my role trying to better connect design and that science community, and, and then I just hope that that grows. Um, mm. The number of conversations I have, vice versa, either in industry or in the science community where you're able to connect people, um, uh, designers who have a specific sort of area of interest and get them in with a scientist who has a you know, specific area of interest, you know the results will be of greater impact in the future. So I think so much of it, yes, it is about collaboration. It's hard to know who to collaborate with to start with, so a lot of it's about just creating connectivity, creating this better network between us. We all work in, you know, science is you know, quite similar to design. I mean, we, we do go through this iterative process. We, we want to get to an end point. Um, we're actually not that different. Um, it's, you know, and I think we can benefit from each other. Uh, my attention to detail, unlike a scientist, is shocking, but my, you know, um, desire to give an end user an experience and a product that they desire is is possibly greater. So I think you know we have an unbelievable ability to um, create, you know, we'll, we'll build on what we already have in terms of a, a design community, you know, very well intermingled with the science community. I think to draw parallels um, from Jane's work in the uh, public sector as well, I think. It's been great to see design sort of integrating into some of these other um, networks of, uh, of capability as well. Uh, and, you know, sort of with, with the public sector, design coming in and being able to contribute to some of those other um, practices as well to yeah, add, add that kind of value. Um, are there any sort of questions, Jenny? I mean, this sort of follows on, I guess, from the, the previous conversation slightly as well. So if there's anything that you didn't get kind of answered from the, the, the panel, so the, the speakers, um, Question, uh, 
the speaker's last time, feel free to kind of um, push it into this se um, session here. Any questions? <coughs> Question observation. Yep. Uh, <laughs> now, in, in building digital things, basically every digital company of any sort of size in the world has settled into the same pattern where you take a small group of people, which is a computer scientist, a designer, maybe someone that does some testing, maybe an owner, but you know, that's about it, right? Mm. And then you replicate that model until you get to 60,000 employees like Google. And like, there's no, like we don't, you don't even talk about integrating a scientist and a designer because each one of those people, especially the designer, is uniquely useless if you can't, <laughs> you know, work with other people. And so, like, you know, why is it not, uh, you know, how, how does that, you know, like there seems to be more of a tension in the physical manufacture, mm. you know, why is that model not sort of so replicated in a, in a physical sense, like, is it just because companies aren't born the same way, is the manufacturing is harder, is um, just the, the way those companies scale is different, that necessarily the workforces are more siloed, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting um, physical product um, is inherently time consuming. Um, we've just uh, we sponsored the Lightning Lab manufacturing accelerator that just finished uh, uh, out in the hut last week, and you know in New Zealand we've had a number of digital accelerators, and um, those companies are quite quick and efficient to get to their minimum viable product um, and the people who seem to work in those teams, um, you know, coder versus a designer and it's all digital are quite closely related. I think with physical product, the people needed to get from design right through to sort of hardcore mass manufacturing really are quite different yeah. people and with quite different skill sets. So it's a little more challenging to maybe all sit down and and be exactly on the same wavelength. I mean, uh, product engineers are different than product designers. Um, and yeah, there is a transitional issue just because of the, the complexity of making three-dimensional product. Um, and then there, that scale-up part where there's this developing of a, of a concept and everyone's still going oh, we still have to pay for the tooling and all the manufacturing and everyone's hesitant to nearly get to the end result and uh, you want it to be as perfect as possible because if you have to make a change it costs a lot of money and so I, I think there's this I mean we are being able to utilise some of that digital um, so the agile ability, you know, with digital manufacturing, we are moving into a, a new space for, for um, manufactured products. You know, as designers, we need to be thinking about what is the quickest, fastest way to get product on the market, and how do we not cost the investors too much money so that we, we test. But we still struggle with, um, yeah, just purely what it costs. I, I guess, it, I mean, you know, I don't know, because I, I don't know about manufacturing, but like, you know, whether it's the same analogy that's happened to software, like, you know, I think the Johnny Ive thing, where someone asks him for his process, it's the thinking and the making and the doing all at the same time. And, and that's all it is. Yep. And then you think about how software used to be built, yep. which w was basically like tooling. You yep. sent off some specs to some enterprise people, and four years later, it came out four years <laughs> later, and it was shit. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's sort of the same sort of thing with physical tooling, where the industry went, well, wow, we're just going to constantly churn out shit uh, if we have this kind of approach. And I wonder if there's going to be the same, you know, like in 10 years' time, whether the, the, the path that gets followed is a little bit different for, like, physical, yep. and so the necessary integration of a science of design sort of no longer becomes a, a conversation or something, because mm -hmm. it can happen so more yep. so fluid. I think it is starting to happen. Part of the, the companies I'm dealing with are kind of stuck in that old model. Like, the one company I, I'm dealing with has been doing uh, timber construction, timber beams for since the 50s or something. Uh, they recently bought this multi-million dollar CNC machine and it sits in their floor and they're 
and they thought this was going to revolutionize, uh, revolutionize the world for them, but they're doing the exact same thing they did 50 years ago with this brand new technology. Right? They don't understand that this machine can now do something much different. Um, and it's just driven by data. Um, but because they're still kind of stuck in that, that way of thinking, that traditional way of thinking, they need someone else. They need that designer. They need someone else that says, wait a minute, this machine doesn't care if it's cutting this or this. Right? How do we begin to redesign, re rethink tooling? It's no longer about tooling at that point. It's about data at that point. Um, so the designer is the key component, I think, person that's, for me, it's important for education to bring that both of those worlds in there so that I'm educating a designer that understands that data but also understands that physical output and can make that connection for them and just kind of jump in and, and, and help them with, with all of them. Anybody else want to comment just before? Well, I'm going to build on, so okay. maybe I can do that thing that's a comment and a question. <laughs> so uh, in particular, I wanted to ask Jenny a bit about, um, we're talking about collaboration and the nature of some industries, you know, like at zero, where it has to be there or the team's not going to work, the product's not going to come together. Um, and Sandy talked a little bit about this also in um, training the next generation of entrepreneurs or designers or scientists. Um, your job, Jenny, in terms of leading a new enterprise program, in some respects, is how do you teach collaboration, or how can we help instill tools early on so people go into the world with that's the default, you know, that's how you breathe, right? Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you've, you've yeah. cause I know this has been a bit of work, yeah. figured out how to do it with yeah. um, your program. That's right, I think that's really important. And um, as one of the, I guess if you look at, my, my background is, uh, is, is business, and so, um, for example, you know, through, um, doing a PhD through the School of Management, and so that's kind of what I know. And the, I guess the danger of sort of coming up with one specific discipline like that is that you're just surrounded with what was one kind of people. And I think that can be really dangerous. And so what we've done in terms of the, um, the, the format of the Master of Innovation and Commercialization is we're really recognising that it's the absolute value of knowing how to interact with people who are complete, have a completely different um, educational background and a completely different, different way of looking at the world. And so how I would look at a problem will be completely, well not completely different, but probably quite substantially different to how you would look at it, um, to how Jim would look at a problem, um, you know, coming from a physics background, and um, from how I, someone who comes from a law degree, a law background. And so, what we've done is um, we're sort of recognising that for any project to really work, it needs a very strong sort of multidisciplinary approach. But we're also recognising uh, that um, projects generally are most successful when they start off with one person who has that absolute drive and the passion, or who's kind of holding the, the torch for that, for that particular project, and is doing a lot of hard donkey work but that person needs to be surrounded by a very supportive and committed team. And so that, that team may, may come in the form of um, you know, the, um, the technical expertise on, the, on, their, on their team, their board of directors, their advisors, and what I've seen very much in my research on, on business incubators is that almost every company, so I've interviewed 33 companies, 31 of those, essentially had one person who was kind of just doing all that donkey work, but they had a very large team around them, um, which was comprised of people from the incubator staff, their various shareholders, employees, and they were from a multidisciplinary background. And so just having that um, diversity within that team to sort of get people to look at things from a completely different perspective, I think is very, very important. And so you're really learning not so much by what you're being taught as such, but by, by, by being challenged and to say, how about, you know, you haven't even considered this approach, you know, what? Um, so it's really having the diversity, I think, is, is quite key. Jane, you're allowed to speak, but you're limited to 50 words. <laughs> Jane, if we can bring that to the undergraduate space. I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> if we can bring that multidisciplinary approach, I absolutely agree with it, and I yeah. wonder if we could bring it to the undergraduate space. Um, so it would challenge the structure of our siloed you know, departments. Yes. 
Yes, uh, is, it a, is it a generational shift? Yesterday we saw young people come and save us who um, don't have all those boundaries. That's 15. Oh, stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Raoul, do you want to respond? Uh, yes, uh, uh, comment on that and on that. Can we bring that even earlier? Yeah. What would be game changing? We are talking a lot about incubator programs and accelerator pro programs, but you use an incubator when someone needs help because it was born uh, not in the right way and needs a bit of assistance. You need an accelerator when you need to make, make something better. Absolutely agree with you, but how we can, we are talking about 10 years' time, how business is going to be in our industry. And, but, so can we bring that 10 years earlier and have those programs at 15 years old yeah. so they have already the right man, mindset and the mm -hmm. right understanding when they launch their businesses on a key partner at 25 years old, they have a real uh, ideal understanding of what could be done and a mindset. So we cannot dictate culture back to our presentation, but what we can dis help influence culture by designing programs earlier on. Mm -hmm. That's well, it's already, you know, being asked for. You know, textile students would already want, they already want engineers to come in. They want scientists to come in. So, you know, the need's established. There's a want. Yeah, but uh, I even yeah. meant that really earlier in the process, like part of our education for teenagers. Right. It's not, probably I'm not at the university or PhD level. Yeah. But the next year is some Well, we're going to hear from um, a high school. Is Demelza here? Demelz is going to talk about her experiences at high school um, design education later on, so it's quite interesting to, to um, feed into um, this conversation. I think one of the things, just to digress slightly, and to talk about um, you know, design kind of this process really is to try and um, get some of these conversations going, I think, and, and look at design, um, you know, the systematic approach to developing design within New Zealand as well, so we can take some more of those long-term views and develop, you know, what, what's it going to look like in 10 years' time? How do we actually cater for um, that through our educational um, programs? What is industry going to look like? How do we actually generate research that informs us around what it needs to look like in, in the future as well? Uh, any other questions from the... Yep, yeah. Christian. I, 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 want to, I have a question for you. A lot of what we've been talking about is the commercialisation I wonder, with a, a question to all companies, do you see a future where the commercialization of products is married to the social development of products for people? And do you see an effective marriage between um, private entities and socially driven government initiatives in the future? Do you, or do you see that as uh, being a diversion and not what we're talking about? We talk a lot about collaboration, but do, we see, uh, do you see an effective future um, of collaboration between private entities? Um, I mean, from a personal standpoint, and I mean, I think this would come through from Callahan as well. Is I mean, especially in the the medical space. I mean, the medical tech space. I mean, we see companies that have started by solving a true user need. Um, that ultimately become commercially successful products. So I, I don't see any personally any reason why that you know, isn't a very valid solution. Um, I mean, I think for, for Callaghan, it's just sitting in a slightly funny spot that we really are a support mechanism for what others think is a good space to be exploring. Um, but I mean, we definitely see it as the best sort of medical space solutions. Um, but I mean, I'd love to see the same thing with, you know, housing. Personally, um, I, I don't know why we don't invest more in solving our own internal uh, sort of dilemma there, and no doubt we would come up with solutions that were globally uh, useful and 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 uh, would you know meet a market in other locations. So uh, personally, I, I would think that's yeah a solid way to go. Anybody else want to respond to that? I almost feel like I should because I'm probably the only architect on the panel and <laughs> you're talking about, about housing issues and you know this has been a problem in architecture for you know since we started making houses out of wood machines and um, but 
the, the problem with architecture is it's much more complex than that, right? I, you don't want to generate a housing that's globally, you, you're not going to want to buy a house for yourself and your family that looks like a million other houses, right? Architecture is, there's a lot of effort going into building it. It's usually a bespoke, a bespoke piece of mm -hmm. architecture because people want to personalize it. They want to uh, be able to do it. That's really kind of my interest in, in my, my research is can we do that? Can we through the manufacturing process, through the digital process, digital process, make it a bespoke product and still make it socially responsive. Or, um, but the, the social issue is, is huge. It's a big question, especially in, in architecture, um, one that we're not going to solve in this panel. We're probably not going to solve in our lifetime um, because we've been trying to solve it for many lifetimes. Um, but um, it, it, it's a question that's always out there. It's something that's pushing this all the time. Um, it's pushing innovation. It's definitely there, but uh, it's it's a huge, huge question. Can I just make a rhetorical <laughs> comment or question really quickly, just because I, I really like your question, Tristan, and I think what's interesting in, in Jesse's response is that you know, you're know you speaking from the point of view of Callahan, but then also saying, but personally, I think it's a good idea. And Callahan supports um, you know ideas that have some potential you know, for commercialization and that sort of thing. And I guess what I think might be the, the hidden elephant in the room is that when we're talking about impact, right, there's the economic impact of commercialization, but there could also be a social impact, and we tend to put the value on, you know, the monetary rather than the social, and I think that maybe what would be nice is to see those things weighted more equally. I mean, you know, I mean, we have the, the struggle with, um, you know, supporting high growth businesses who ultimately may want to exit at some point to sell that business internationally versus uh, supporting sustainable lifestyle businesses that employ people in a region that you know we really want to have high value manufacturing in. So what is the balance there? Um, you know, I can make a personal comment on what I think is you know, the best way to go, but I think there's a real mix there that we inherently as New Zealanders, and I see this a lot, create businesses around things that we love. So we don't want to exit in the same way that other nations do. And so we build these very nice, and I mean seriously if I had a five million to a twenty million dollar company, I'd be pretty happy with that. Um, so Defining what success is, um, I think, needs to be relative to what we think lifestyle in New Zealand is really all about. So that, that's a, an interesting one. And I mean, I get to work with those people who have those sorts of businesses, and they are you know, fantastic to work for. But it's not and unusual also, globally, is it? Because, um, you know, if you, we're just doing some work with small to medium enterprises, and I always thought that New Zealand was kind of unique in that, it was what we do. But when you look at the numbers around the world, most countries, their, their businesses are made up of small to medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. the scale that's so different. And I think that's the really hard thing with commercialisation here. It's really hard to get the numbers to work because. You know, we're not dealing with a big local market, so your next step is this giant step. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of more work that needs to be done around that. If we, and I know organisations like Canon that are trying to help organisations do that, but yeah, I think it's partly an aspiration thing, but mm. partly a reality of, of what's required. And I think I liked what Sandy was talking about, about joining the dots and making the connections and the collaborations to. I think there's a lot of invisibility here, even though that's kind of ironic. Given, you know, we can pick up the phone call, you know, the phone one degree of separation and speak to anyone we like. But, but at the same time, we do work in silos, and I think a lot of what needs to happen is, you know, illumination of, of you know, where the possible partnerships are yeah. and facilitating collaboration. Because I think once that happens, acceleration can accelerate. But sometimes too with. Um your question, um, Callahan are funding those projects through the different funding streams, not in high value manufacturing, but through more bio area streams of money, so it's coming through the health, and those health projects are contributing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to um, wrap it up. Just one last point that I want to finish on. It seems that um, a lot of commercialisation is science and technology driven uh, in New Zealand at the moment, and design gets brought in. Uh, at the latter stages of that to kind of help. 
And do you think that there's an opportunity to flip that model on its head and have design lead some of those um, bigger projects and bring the science and technology in behind some of those uh, identified needs uh, at some point in the future? Or is that never going to happen? I'm happy to have that one. I was very um, teared up over the morning when I heard on Radio New Zealand that there's a motion before Fonterra to reduce the number of farmers on the boards. Right. Because I think in my experience I've come across some boards that are blokes and they haven't got the expertise of design, they haven't got the expertise of getting to market and the boards are too many people all the same. Yeah. And I think that we get people on boards with design knowledge, yeah. that would help. Great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's one little thing. Anybody else want to respond? I, I think it's vital that they get in earlier and I think it's uh, more important for design to maybe take that role and mm -hmm. take a little bit more charge and kind of let them know what's what's available, what's, yeah. what, what, we, what we can offer them. I think too often we're in our own silos saying, well, I'm the best designer, I can do this better than anybody else and they'll come to me rather than us going out and saying, I can offer this, I can offer um, a communication between these groups to allow a little more collaboration, allow more of this to happen. And, and I'm working in a group that's doing something similar. We're bringing just a bunch of kind of weird, disparate industries together, and we're talking about things like that. And it's amazing when you get them all on the table in the same room, how much they, everything, and there's, it's not quite as unique as, as you think it is. They all have the same problems. They all want to talk about these. They all want them solved. But as designers, we're problem solvers. That's what we do. That's what we're trained to do. That's why we need to be there at the table. Yeah, I, I think. There's, there's huge potential, but I think it is on us to make it really obvious what value we add. You know, we are the translators. Um, you know, we are the people who are good at collaborating and working with lots of different industries. If others don't know <coughs> what value design adds, then we have to, and I think this is the whole premise of running this uh, sort of event, is we have to better explain what value we have. I mean, you know, uh, we, we can't complain that we're not at the front end or at the top end of the table. Um, we just have to find a way to get there. Um, and I mean, there's, we do have great examples of design lead firms in New Zealand. You know, it probably still ends up being design engineering led, but it's pretty close. And, um, you know, they are very successful. And I think there's every chance that we can yeah be truly designed in the future. Fantastic. I think that's a good point. And Dr, can I just thank our uh, panel uh, chat?